So here's one thing that you could potentially look for um, on the branch of a tree is a silk moth cocoon. What we have here is a silk moth cocoon attached to a stick. This was probably a Polyphemus or Cecropia moth. He's unlabeled, so we won't know what he is until he hatches out. You can see that there have been leaves stuck to the silk of the cocoon. This is how they camouflage the cocoon and keep it safe. Uh, what we're looking at is just a silk outer covering that the caterpillar produced when he was making this cocoon. Inside is the actual pupa, which looks something like this. Wow. This is the actual living part of the cocoon. It's wrapped up in silk that's inside there. You can see it has segments along the body um, and even a pair of wing pads. Wow. And there's the face. So you can kind of see the beginning of some structures that are starting to develop. It's starting to look like a little curled up moth. Mm -hmm. And there's his back. So since he's out of his cocoon, is he kind of He's actually done? a different, um, he's a sphinx moth. Oh, okay. So they make naked pupa. Mm -hmm. They don't have the silk cocoon around them. Mm. Uh, so what they do is they make a little cell underground mm. and that's where they overwinter. Okay. Um, so all of these chrysalids and cocoons are overwintering. They are in diapause, which is what we call bug hibernation. It's a state of suspended development and where they're not going to freeze as well. They actually produce an anti a natural antifreeze over the winter uh, so that they don't perish. This is another sphinx moth, not a silk moth, a sphinx moth. Mm -hmm. So we're different from the cocoon that you can find in trees. This one you might find when you're digging around in your garden. This is the cupa for a snowberry clear wing moth. Wow. Uh, we call them hummingbird moths because they fly like little bitty hummingbirds. Those are so pretty. So do they usually um, keep those in uh, underground like you were talking or are yes. they underneath leaves? Yeah, they're, yeah, so they're they actually the bury them. They actually bury themselves. Cool. Uh, so when you're tilling or weeding or preparing your garden, you may unearth something like this. It's a moth of some kind. About how deep do they usually go? It's pretty shallow. Pretty shallow, it's yeah. It's fairly shallow. That's why you'd be able to pull That's it up really easy. That's why you'd be able easy. to pull them up really easily. Yeah, cool. they're not pretty deep down in there like beetle grubs. All right, the other critters I have today are butterflies. We've explored moths, now we're on to butterflies. These are all swallowtail chrysalis, which is what we call the pupa of a butterfly. You may have learned it in grade school as a cocoon, but the vocabulary word we're learning today is chrysalis. And these are all different species of swallowtails, which are a butterfly that goes into diapause locally. You may have heard of migratory butterflies like the monarch uh, that fly away very long distances even. These stay right here. So in the fall, the caterpillars make their chrysalis, but instead of emerging as a butterfly within a couple weeks, they stay in the chrysalis as the temperatures lower and we go into winter. And they'll come out when temperatures stabilize again back in the spring. Um, and you can see they are formed on sticks. They kind of sling themselves back. Let's see, we've got, we have any eastern black swallowtails in here? We should. Here they are. What's their host plant? The reason I bring this one up is because mm -hmm. the, the black swallowtail, its host plant is many common garden herbs. Their host plant cool. is the carrot family, and that includes some common garden herbs like parsley, dill, fennel, um, some uncommon ones like rue. Uh, so this is uh, often a lot of people's first caterpillar experience because it's, oh, something's eating my parsley, right? We had some on the fennel. Some on the fennel. Yeah. yeah. They love fennel. That was very cool. They will strip it completely of leaves, but it's okay. The plant comes back. The caterpillar is healthy. It's a good thing. Uh, when we had them on the fennel, we looked up and saw that sometimes the caterpillars uh, move off the fennel to mm -hmm. create their chrysalis. They do. Why do they do that? Uh, or so that where is, do they go? That's a phase called wandering. So it's when they reach the end of their caterpillar development and they're getting ready to pupate, which is making the chrysalis. They need to lose a little weight 
they have to kind of slim down a little bit. <laughs> okay. To wiggle out of that caterpillar skin uh -huh. and get into the pupa stage, so they go for a little jog. <laughs> they wander. And what they're doing also is they're looking for the ideal place to put their chrysalis. They're looking mm -hmm. for where their uh, special place is going to be for the next several weeks. And they will find some odd and very often man-made structures. I've had them stuck to garbage cans, mm -hmm. siding on houses, mm -hmm. hoses, anything. Anything cool. in the garden they'll stick themselves to. So just keep an eye out for anything that looks a little weird and unusual, especially if it looks kind of leafy. This is a really fun one. This is a giant swallowtail. And it looks very much to me like bark on a tree. Mm-hmm. It really does look just like a piece of tree broke off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so this is their main defense here. So we're in the butterfly flight house right now. Uh, this is where in temperate seasons, we release the butterflies to do all of their natural behaviors. They can fly, they can mate, they feed on nectar from the flowers, and generally just enjoy a butterfly's life. When it's the end of butterfly season, typically the end of September when we're transitioning into October, we've released our butterflies to migrate. They're starting to hibernate and like the swallowtails that we just explored. So what we do is we take the flight house and we throw some orb weaving spiders in here and we let them uh, make their webs and people can actually come in here and walk through a spider house instead of a butterfly house. It's very safe. We make sure that there are no webs in the path so no one gets a face full of spider. And if you come in here at night, we can give you a little flashlight, red flashlight, so you don't bother the spiders and you can view them. So we try to clean this out after the spider exhibit so that we don't end up with spider eggs everywhere. But we always miss a few. Um, so these are uh, something that you can actually find in your own yard or garden because the spiders that we use are local to our area. These are the egg sacs of the golden garden spider, which is our largest local orb weaving spider. By orb weaving, I mean it makes a pretty round web, just like in Charlotte's web. Mm -hmm. That's an orb weaver. Um, and so the female makes these very big pendulous egg sacs uh, near her website. And this is, these are deposited in the autumn. And the female then dies at the freeze and these overwinter. So they've been hanging here for several months. They're full of spider eggs. So what we'll do is we'll pull them out before they're ready to hatch. We'll let them hatch and then we'll take the spiders off site to disperse. So would one spider have made that at each egg sac? Yes. So two spiders. Or could this, one this spider one have spider. done both? This okay. Was one spider. So one spider was able to make both of those. Yes, she did. Okay. Wow. I know that it's like a ballpark estimate, but like how many spider oh, I'm so bad at facts and at numbers like it's that. It's okay. It's all right. A, a lot. lot. <laughs> a lot. More We're than talking hundreds of yeah, spider hundreds eggs. of spiders. Cool. Yes. Wow. And uh, these disperse just like just like in Charlotte's Web, mm. they hatch out, oh, they they're extremely away. tiny, they make a little silk thread, and electrostatic power takes them along. This one is also a spider egg sac. This is made by a related species called the banded orb weaver. Oh. Um, so she makes a little gumdrop shaped sac. So it's a little different than the pendulous one. However, these two spiders are related to each other. They're both in the genus Argiope. On the fence here, we have something else that you can find in your own yard or garden. This is the egg case, what we call the Uthika, of the Carolina praying mantis, which is our native local praying mantis. Um, it looks like a little oblong brown uh, pod. It's very hard to the touch. Down the middle here is a line and uh, Mantids have already um, hatched, so this is actually an egg case from last year. Uh, the cycle of the praying mantis is that the eggs hatch in the spring when temperatures stabilize. They take all spring, summer, and autumn to develop. The females lay the egg case in autumn. She passes on the egg case over winters and pops out in the spring and the cycle continues. This is particularly a species of praying mantis that we want to support 
because the other species of praying mantis we find locally is a Chinese species. Mm. Um, and so when we have a non-native and a native competing, we typically almost always want to support the native species. Um, so this is actually a product that we will be selling here at Idlewild in the spring. What's the process like to actually introduce praying mantises into or praying mantids? Am I saying that correctly? You can either pray mantises okay. or mantids. Mm -hmm. So once you get the egg case, what do you do with it in your garden? Right, you have two main options. One thing you can do is take it outside and use a piece of string to tie it into a shrub or piece of foliage. But if you want to actually experience the hatching, you can get a small mesh enclosure to place the egg case inside and you can simply sit it inside your house in a warm, safe location, and it will hatch in about two to eight weeks, depending on where it is in its development. Cool. <laughs> and then what this contains, um, again, several dozen, up to a hundred little mantis babies, and they all hatch out at once. So ha hatching that egg case indoors is a really fun experience. <laughs> as long as you have the lid on, right? <laughs> as long as you have the lid on, yes. <laughs>